If you're ready for freedom from the grind, then passive income from real estate investing is the best way to get you there. If you don't know where to start or what to do next, then the Rent Roll Radio Show is the best place to get you there. Join us while we discuss the best practices, strategies, and mindset you'll need and give you actionable content to get you from where you are to where you want to be. Hey, Rent Roll Radio listeners, welcome back. I'm your host, Sterling Chapman. Today, we are sitting here with Hannah Bergeske. Did I, did I pronounce that right, Hannah? No, it's Bursage. Bursage. I told you I was going to mess it up. Yeah, you did. You did. I, and I would mess it up 10, time, 10 more times. So <laughs> I apologize. Hannah, is, Hannah has been a friend of mine for a long time. She has been a very faithful um, member of our local meetup. And, and we have started to bump into each other at more and more uh, national conferences as well. She has got a uh, pretty, pretty impressive uh, little rental portfolio here in South Louisiana that she manages with her husband, and they're um, looking to break out to to go to the next level. So um, that's why she's been she's been going to these conferences around the country, um, looking to, to to break out to the next level. So Hannah, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Anna, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, what you were doing before, how you got into real estate and like kind of what your portfolio yeah, looks like today? Absolutely. So um, my, I still have a day job. I have a WQ. I'm a school teacher. I teach elementary education. My husband um, is a chemical operator at a, at a plant out here on the river. We have always been interested in real estate. But, you know, ever since we were little, we were told if you want to make money, go get a job. You want to make more money, get a better paying job. And it just felt like it wasn't it. Like it just didn't feel like it was it for life. Um, COVID happened right before COVID. My husband and I bought a ridiculously large house in a country club on the golf course, 3,200 square feet. You know, I had the BMW. He had the brand new truck and a brand new Mustang. We had it, you know, quote unquote, had it all. And COVID started to to get a little crazy. And my husband came home one day. He's like, I don't know what's going to happen. They're talking about shutting down the plant. You know, the whole world is ending. And I'm like, oh, my God, we're going to die. Because we can't afford anything on a teacher's salary. So out of fear, he went out and bought like a $20,000 used work truck in case, you know, he lost his job, he lost his vehicles. Like at least we got something. And I was like, okay, I can't, I can't live this. This is, this, this is poop. Um, and so we started talking a little bit more about real estate. Once um, a little bit of the COVID craziness started to, to relax a little bit, we started actually going to several local meetups. And we said, okay, let's do it. And we just started kind of looking, just kind of looking, trying to figure out what to do. We read a ton of books, listened to the podcast, you know, did all the things. And we found a house off of MLS. I had, um, I was working on getting my real estate license as well. We found a house on MLS. We we're like, okay, well, let's just buy this because it's brand new. Nothing's broken. Let's try it out. Someone else had gotten to it before we did. And I was like, okay, well, maybe, you know, he's just telling me this thing for us and we need to do something else. The next day, the mortgage owner said, hey, this person's financing fell out. We were like, okay, let's buy it. So I remember when we bought that house, I was beyond terrified. It was a 20% <laughs> down conventional mortgage with a ton of money out of our savings account. I handed that check. My hand was shaking, I remember. But uh, I was super excited. We bought that house in December of 2020. We did not get a renter until March of 2021. I'm out of all this money. I am terrified. The world is ending. It was just horrible. However, when we got that tenant in there and we got that first rent check, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> sell everything. I don't care if I have no shoes. I want to buy more. And so that's what we did. We sold the big house. We went down to a tiny three bedroom, two bath starter home, took equity out of that, bought two more, ended up just kind of kept doing it. We ended up, um, we have three single family homes at this point. We have the one we just bought to, to live in as well, which will turn into a rental in a couple of years. Um, so we have a couple single family homes. I like new construction because there are no problems. If something breaks nine times out of 10, it's under warranty. So I can't get it fixed. Um, they're really easy to fill. People like new houses and I can get a ton of money for them. Um, that was a value add project that I bought off market. Um, that one is a completely different ball game. Still learning that one. It's been great. My rents, we've been able to increase rents. We've added value by updating apartments. We've changed out the 
the clientele has changed. Um, that one's been a really, really, really great experience. Um, and as far as the conferencing goes, I love the conferences. I genuinely believe that proximity is power and the people you put yourself around is what you're going to aspire to be. One day I'm going to be Joe Fairless flying in on my chopper to go to a conference. I'm not there yet, but it, that's the goal. So that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. 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 So uh, you, have you sold that apartment complex yet? It is currently for sale. We've done, um, awesome. we bought it off market. So I was like, mm, let's try selling it off market, not getting a whole lot of hits on that. So we're actually getting ready to list it with a broker probably within the next month. Oh, cool. 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 Yeah. And so what have, what did you learn that was different with your experience with the apartment complex versus the single family house? Cause there was more than one difference, right? Not only was it a multifamily versus a single family, but I think the apartment complex was a good bit older versus your yes. new construction single families. Did you run into some things that you you're not running into with the the new stuff? Oh my gosh, like issues upon issues upon issues. I I don't think I'll buy another older property. Um, I grew up in a house that my parents built. It was like piecemeal six houses put together to make one type thing. So it's not really my favorite. I don't mind the demo part. I will knock down a wall any day of the week. Um, but I don't love. There's just so many problems with so many doors. We also manage it ourselves because it's small. It's only 11 doors. It didn't really make sense for us to hire a property manager. Kind of regretting that right now because I feel like all I do is field phone calls. Um, water heaters. Did you know they break? Because I didn't. Um, tile floor cracks. Things drip from the ceiling. I didn't know these things happened because our new construction houses Everything's perfect all the time. You know, the worst thing that could happen is a garage door hangs up. So I, I call the warranty company to fix it. I will say, though, for plus side with multifamily, it's one closing. I wrote one check. That was easier than going to all the closings with the single family homes. So the scalability that everyone talks about is definitely there for sure. Um, there are definitely pros and cons. It, it's the older property is just tougher. Um, that property like I said, with it being older, also has a different set of people who are going to pay $975 versus the people who are paying me $2,400 a month for my houses. So that's a different set of issues. Everybody's been nice for the most part, but it, it brings its own set of issues for sure. Absolutely. And, and um, everybody will not continue to be nice. It, when, you're, no. when you're in the business of kicking people out of their houses, you don't make a lot of friends. <laughs> See, that's the thing, though. We've been doing this for going on two and a half years. I've never evicted anyone. Yeah. Never. Yeah. I had a tenant beginning of April, ghost us, packed yeah. up, moved out, shut the power off. This is the first time I've cried over a tenant. I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> tough when it comes to, to issues. I cried at my kitchen counter for probably 20 minutes because they owe us money. I have to get all these permits to put the electricity back on. I need to get it rented, like all these issues. Um, but for the most part, we've had really, really good success. So are you considering now going to the third party management solution going forward? So I met with a friend in Houston several weeks ago and he is into syndication and I have been kicking around the idea of getting into syndication. Brad and I are looking at buying a couple of franchises currently. If we buy those franchises, I think I want to sell it all, give my money to someone and let y'all go make me some money because I am, I'm strapped for time. I'm really struggling balancing, you know, I have a day job. I have a baby at home. You know, I couldn't take less. I had dinner with a friend. All we do, it feels like is real estate, which I love, but the balance is it's starting the, you know, the teeter totter, it's really starting to get heavy on one side. Um, so, yes, I think we're leaning towards management. The houses, that's easy. If we keep them, I'll probably just keep doing it because they're new. We don't have issues. For larger scale buildings, I'm going to have to hire somebody. Yeah, for sure. Well, what I found was, and I've gone full cycle, right? Like I, I self-managed and then I was like, oh, I never want to do that again. And then, right. And then I went to a bunch of bad property managers and then we went, we took it in-house and now we're going to manage other people's properties. But right. in, that, in that period of time, when other people were managing my properties terribly, and I was losing money from the properties, but I was making like so much more money in yeah. all these other areas that I had time and mental bandwidth 
to go work in, right? Like I was, I had 26 units when I, when I, you know, turned it over to property management, right? Fast right. forward a few, few years and we've got five apartment complexes and like 80 single family houses. And it's like, if, if I was still managing those 26 units, I would only have those 26 units. I wouldn't have the other That's houses. Not. I wouldn't have the apartment complexes because I would spend all of my time fighting with tenants and water and you know what I mean? And I just, we are in that exact position right now. And it's, it's hard to turn over and it's, it's, it's hard to turn over because we, you know, we have scarcity mindsets and we look at like the, we, we do the math is what stops us from doing it. Right. We're like, Mm -hmm. Oh wow. I'm going to, you know, if I get somebody else to manage this property, I'm going to be spending $36,000. $36,000. I'm paying $36,000 a year. You know, I'm only making $42,000 right. a year and I'm going to give it all that. What do I do it for? But what you don't realize is, is, or what I've found, what my experience has been through that, that whole you know, debacle is like, yes, you're paying that money, but the, the, the units that you buy are going to appreciate. And then the debt's going to pay down and then all this other stuff. And then you have time to flip houses. And then you have time to syndicate apartment complexes. And so like, it's, it's kind of like you're going to spend a hundred thousand to make 2 million type of thing. Right. It's been kind of my experience on the, the trade-off there. Um, and that is and absolutely I'm, where we're headed. Yeah. And I mean, I just think it it just what it really boils down to a lot, I find, is what you what you want out of your your real estate investing career, what you want out of life, right? Like if if your intention you just you've got it like when you're making these choices, like that's those are the type of things you if you if you want to be a small business, you can manage it yourself. If you want, you know, to buy 10 single family houses and pay them all off and manage them yourself and that be your retirement you know what i mean like that's that's very like you could do that that's right that is one one approach and there's nothing wrong with that approach and the person who takes that approach probably is a very stress life right like that's just not the approach i'm taking because i want a billion dollars worth of real estate correct i also want that i genuinely believe that brad and i my husband are building an empire i feel very strongly that if you are not a person who is going to make our empire stronger, then you can hang out outside the moat that has sharks inside of it. I want to make this grow exponentially. I'm a big Grant Cardone fan, 10X all the way. And right now, part of that 10Xing is the fear of letting go, like you talked about. That apartment complex, for example, that's my baby. You know, I I know how to lay tile and I can help Brad change a toilet and we can do these things because Financially, we had to. It didn't make sense for us to hire out in the beginning. But at this point now, moving forward, I need to be able to let go of the reins a little bit, delegate some more, let other people handle this so that we can focus on buying a business or building another building another um, portfolio ad. You know what I'm saying? We have to be able to do that. Because ultimately, you know, when it comes to scaling, um, you're the problem. It's not it's not oh, 100%. your percent. It's not your employees. It's not your property managers. It's not your tenants. It's you and your your unwillingness to let go of control. And when I say you, I'm oh, pointing yeah, three, three fingers back at me. <laughs> but like, yeah, I, I do this all the my, my I do this all the time. I hire people to do stuff, and then I get impatient or frustrated. Five minutes mm-hmm. in, I'm like, here, just let me do it. Just let me do it. Yeah. And it's like I already paid them to do it. Why am I doing it? And it's because I'm a right. control freak. And it's yeah. just. It's it's hard to give up. It's hard to let go of the vine. But that's you know, unless you want to be a you know a two man shop with ten paid off single family houses in thirty years, which there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, that's not the direction that we want to go. I want right. to be able to wake up on a Tuesday morning and be like, hey, let's go to Paris and have baguettes for lunch. And I want to be able to hop in a plane and go. That's that's my goal ultimately. That's what I would like to do. So, so what is next for y'all? Because, you know, when we were talking at at best ever, you were like at a crossroads. You were like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do next. I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know if I want to do that. So Uh, I'm I'm still struggling a little bit with that, with what I want to do. I did buy the entire set to have a podcast. I went and talked with some hotels. I want to host a local meetup. I love going to yours. 
but occasionally traffic is murderous in Baton Rouge. So I want to have something a little local in Ascension. Um, I still want to do the meetup. I don't think I'm as interested right now in creating a podcast because we're now talking about buying these franchises. But buy these franchises. I'm looking at American Freight. It's a furniture company. And we're also looking um, currently at Benjamin Franklin's a plumbing company. Um, so I'm looking at those two pretty hard right now. Nothing solid. Haven't saw anything. Just thinking. Um, and if I do those two, I'll teach for about one more year. And then I'll leave teaching and focus on the businesses, real estate. I don't know, baking cookies on a Tuesday with my daughter type thing. Um, so I'm still very much at a crossroads. I'm figuring out. I've been reading a lot of books to kind of help with personal growth. So we shall see. So tell me more about the franchises. How did you come across that? Who are you working with on that? What does that look like? How do you buy a franchise? So uh, some friends of mine are buying a pure life franchise. We do more of a holistic medicinal approach. Lots of, um, they do have things like IVs, but like, you know, red light therapies, things like that. And I am super, super excited for them. And everyone I know who has a W-2 is miserable. Nobody really loves their job. I don't care what anyone says. You know, I'm a teacher and I love to teach, but I don't enjoy my job as much as I used to. And so I was kicking around the ideas of well, like if it was if it was fun, they wouldn't have to pay us to go to work. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but I was kicking around the idea of doing something and I I love the teaching um schedule. You know, I'm done by 3 30 and I I can go run our business after work. That's what I do every single day. And I was like, I've got to do something. And Brad was like, well, let's let's just, you know, talk to Christina and Victor, our friends who are opening the Pure Life and and get some ideas. And so I was talking. We were actually sitting on the couch one afternoon and I was like, why can't there just be like a room full of franchises that like say, pick me, pick me. And he's like, Hannah, Google it. And I was like, oh, didn't even think about that. So I Googled it and found out that that weekend they were actually having a franchising expo in Houston. So we went to Houston got into a room full of tons and tons of people. I met with a guy named Dustin Helms. He is our broker. He had us fill out a questionnaire about likes, dislikes, what kind of financial position you're in, where do you want to be kind of thing. And from there, he's like, okay, I think this, 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 and this will work for you. Stay away from this. You're not interested in food services. So it kind of helped boil it down to what we wanted to do. Um, And the, the two that we're talking about are kind of the two that we're looking at now. From there, you're going to get on some phone calls with the people who who represent these companies and they break down for you, you know, what the initial investment is going to be. What do you expect to do hour wise? How many employees do you need to have? We are kind of just past that point currently. Um, I'm really excited about these opportunities. I am also terrified by these opportunities because unlike real estate. Are these businesses you have, do you have to work in the business? If I go the American freight option, no, I'm going to hire a manager and I will pop in randomly two or three times a week and be like, hey, y'all, I'm here. If I go the plumbing route, I would work in it in a capacity, not necessarily turning wrenches, more of like a like a manager delegating jobs. So it kind of depends on what I want to do. One is significantly more of a financial investment. One is less. So I just need to kind of pick what I want to do. So what what are the I mean what are the typical financial investments for buying a franchise? So American Freight, you have to have around two hundred liquidity, and yeah. you're probably going to be taking loans up to about a million dollars. Um, that covers everything from inventory, uh, leasing a building. We're looking for I believe it's twenty five thousand square feet minimum of a building. You have to be able to. It's basically a warehouse. Um, for the Benjamin Franklin, I'm gonna say a hundred thousand. I can't remember. I'd have to go find my notes. Um, so it just kind of depends on what you want to do. It just depends. Okay. So when you, you said a million dollars of debt on the on the American Freight one, and there's yes. no debt, there's no debt on the plumbing one? There is. I want to say that one's gonna probably be around two, three hundred mil uh th- two to three hundred thousand. Again, I have to find my notes. I can't remember that exactly. The American Freight one is the one I'm most interested in. I really like their business model, I like the way they treat their employees. We've gone to several of their locations. What Everyone except they, one person. What do they do? Do what? What does American Freight do? They sell furniture. The okay. furniture there is going to be um, your, your your target audience is going to be like sixty to ninety thousand dollar a year, you know, households. The quality is going to be better than Amazon or Wayfair, but we're not talking Ethan Allen here. It's the type of thing where you can you pick it up today, you can leave today, which is cool because when you go furniture shopping, do you ever get it that day? No, you wait six to eight weeks. 
hopefully it doesn't come in broken. So it's, it's a really cool business model. The employees there are 100% commission-based, which at first was like, I don't really like that, but I've spoken to several females, which of course, I, me being a woman, I want to see the woman's perspective. And they've all loved it because they control their money. The harder you work, the more money you make. If life is kicking you a little bit and you need to take a week off, then do it. You just don't make any money. So I'm really drawn to that. But another part of what we talked about at Best Ever Conference in Utah, which was amazing, by the way, um, I am at a crossroads because some days I'm like, okay, let's do it. Let's buy this franchise. Some days I'm like, sell everything, give money to a syndicator. And other days I'm like, sell it all. Let's live in a tent because I don't know what I want to do. Sure. I don't think any of us know what we want to do when we grow up. Well, that makes you feel better. Yeah, no, my my employees ridicule me constantly because we'll we'll spend three weeks putting together a comprehensive business plan for a new uh, a new department, and then mm-hmm. by, after we do that, I'll I'll come in, scratch that. We're going a different direction. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that'd be everything. I feel like I'm always looking for something. I'm not a get rich quick person. I know everything's a long game but I have to get more money than I'm currently making. You know, my daughter likes lobster. So there we are. Yeah. So what are you currently looking for from a real estate perspective? Or or are you kind of like, like, are you actively looking for more houses to buy? Are you actively looking for more apartments to buy? I would not call it active. I am always looking. That's just ingrained in who I am. I love the Redfin app and Realtor and just driving for dollars. I'm always looking. However, with us wanting to sell our apartment complex, originally I wanted to 1031 exchange, but the rules and regulations for that just, I I don't like being forced into an answer. So that for me doesn't really work. Um, I'm much more of a deliberate thought driven person. I can't just jump on something. Um, So that I think I've scrapped. At this point, once we sell our complex, we'll probably use some of that to go towards a franchise. Um, And I think from there, we'll kind of just go the syndication route. I'm trying to learn some more about how to syndicate on my own, but more than likely, I will give my money to someone like you and just say, hey, go make me money because I don't know, this week, landlord life has really been kicking my butt (laughs) and I have not been into this at all, like at all. Yeah, so we... um... Like I said, I mean, we're 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 like everybody else. We just have a constant, ongoing identity crisis around here about yeah. who we are and what we do. You know, we started buying rentals and then we were flipping houses and then we were syndicating apartment complexes, and now we're going into property management and then we'll eventually go into third party construction as well. And and what it really boils down to is we 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 serve busy professionals that know that it's important to invest and build wealth through real estate, but don't have the time to actively do it. Right. And we serve them a number of ways. They can invest passively in our apartment syndications. They can um, invest passively in as debt and fund our flips. We can manage their property. If they really do want to have direct ownership, like we can find them rental properties, we can fix them up and we can manage them for you. So we've got all these crazy ideas, but it all boils down to like, residential real estate, like where people live and, right. and how busy professionals, business owners or, or other high income earners are um, are able to take advantage of the real estate investment right. without giving up their high income earning. Um, I want to hop over to our radio round real quick. Um, okay. The first question is, what is your favorite book? Well, what started all is going to be generic like everyone else, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That one absolutely started this entire thing, the, the money mindset shift. Um, you know, we talked about the scarcity mindset. I'm really, really working on that because there's money absolutely everywhere. Um, however, I'm currently reading Tools of Titans. I know it's been out for a while, but I'm really enjoying that one right now. That's Tim Ferriss? Yes. Tim Ferriss? Yep. Tim Ferriss. Uh, Tim Ferriss, yeah. Oh, I've I have eyeballed that one a bunch of times, and I've heard a lot of good references. I've never read it because it's so big, <laughs> it's huge, it's humongous. Um, I take it outside and read when my daughter wants to play out in the yard, and I read it, and it's it's really really good. I love that it's like little mini mini pieces of of other of other greats out in the universe. Um, yeah. But the book is enormous, so prepare yourself <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, what's your favorite quote? Proximity is power. I've said it in this interview. Um, I genuinely believe that wholeheartedly. You put yourself in a room of people who are better than you, and you will, you know, get some of their greatness on you. I believe that one one hundred percent. 
Yeah, for sure. And what's your favorite thing to do outside of work? So when I have the time, which is never anymore, it would have to be traveling. I've traveled pretty extensively all over the world. I love that. Um, <clears throat> but on like a normal day, I'd be baking cookies with my daughter. My little four-year-old Caroline is absolute sunshine and yeah. we're making cookies. Awesome. I, I guess the kids turn into sunshine when they turn four. Uh, uh. When they were, she was little, it was a little bit tougher, but right yeah. now I'm very much enjoying the four-year-old age. She's I, um, I, fabulous. Sun, sunshine is probably not an adjective that my wife <laughs> or I would use for our two or three-year-old. If you know. <laughs> <laughs> that is what I tell everyone when they ask me about Caroline. I say she's sunshine. She is the happiest, <laughs> go-lucky, respectful little girl on the planet. I'm obsessed with her. Awesome. How can our listeners get in touch with you and find out more about you and connect with you? So I'm on Facebook, like most everyone else, it's Hannah Bursa J. I am on Instagram. I believe that one's H Bursa J 10 X. Um, I do have a LinkedIn profile. I'm not super active on it. I'm working on that one. Um, and of course you can, can hit me up through email. If anyone has a question, that's Hannah.Bursa J at gmail.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Hannah. I just, a side note, um, yesterday I put together a comprehensive list of all of the conferences I was interested in going to this year. Great uh, idea. I was, I'll send it to you. That would be great. I'm going to the, uh, what is it, Dealmaker Live at the end of uh, early June. I'm going to that one. It's my next one. I love yeah. the conferences. I, I Again, proximity is power. I was that's in, being that's in, terrified with, do what? That's in Dallas, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I know I spoke to you at Best Ever. I was shaking in my boots. I was so <laughs> scared to be around all those whales. But the information you earn is exceptionally powerful. It's it's far greater than any amount of money you spent because that was a very expensive conference to go to. Um, it was it was eye opening. It was eye opening for sure. I loved it. And I will continue Absolutely. to go to them. I I like. A conf- the the more conference costs, the better I like it because uh, the the price of the ticket keeps um, people that aren't serious out. Gotcha. I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. All right, Hannah. Again, thank you so much. Look forward. I'll send you that list and uh, look forward to keeping up with you in your journey. That sounds great. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. This episode was brought to you by Crestworth Capital. If you're a busy professional and ready to make passive income from real estate investing, then go to CrestworthCapital.com where you'll be able to download a free copy of our ebook to help you get started today. Until next week, happy investing.